please listen to the disclaimer at the end of this episode. Suburban Folk is teaming up with Lashbinder in the month of February for a free giveaway to one of our listeners. Lashbinder is a false lash application system. The method is the fastest system in the world to apply lashes and is beloved by moms, dancers, cheerleaders, beauty schools, makeup artists, and lash lovers everywhere. For every product sold, Lashbinder donates one kit to a chemotherapy patient who has lost her lashes. Visit Lashbinder.com to learn more. To enter the giveaway, head over to SuburbanFolk.com and enter your information into the email subscription list. We will randomly select one winner and announce them on the last show in February featuring a special cancer survivor guest. Health, travel, finance, parenting, and home improvement. This is the Suburban Folk Podcast. $250 a month into my child's 529 from the month that they start kindergarten, I should be able to pay for 80% of my child's college. Because I don't trust that most people will eat their vegetables. So usually our kind of standard is three servings of vegetables per meal. You take something like a a two by six and you cut it with a circular saw. That's like a superpower. Those middle school years are not as fun, but at that age, they're still willing to talk to you. Welcome to the Suburban Folk Podcast. I'm your host, Greg. Today's topic is natural remedies and natural healing, as well as dieting and fitness. My guest is Stacey Chalemi. She's a popular and recognizable health and lifestyle reporter and expert, columnist and health host. She's the author of The Complete Guide to Natural Healing and Natural Remedies for Common Conditions, along with 20 other published books. She's the founder of The Complete Herbal Guide and a recognized health and natural remedies expert with over 20 years in practice as a health coach. She writes for the Huffington Post, has been a guest on the Dr. Oz show, and has appeared in numerous local radio and TV shows. Her focus is on natural healing, herbal remedies, alternative methods, self-motivation, food for medicine, nutrition, fitness, natural beauty remedies, and the power of positive thinking. You can find out a whole lot more on her website, thecompleteherbalguide.com. Stacey, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So looking at your background, you have an interesting path that led you to being a health coach and health expert. Can you walk us through what your history is? has been and what's led you to advising in natural remedies and natural healing? Well, at the age of five, I had come down with um, encephalitis that had traveled to my brain. I ended up in a coma for four days and um, the doctors actually thought I was going to be either paraplegic or have severe brain damage. But after the um, fourth day, I came out and I actually, the first thing I asked for was McDonald's French fries. (laughs) What happened was, is that I didn't end up with... um, as a paraplegic or with severe brain damage, but I did end up with epilepsy and I struggled my entire life trying to deal with the disorder and trying to get through life having seizures periodically. And when I was in college with the stress of studying and and taking tests and, and being up all night long, I was starting to come across a lot of seizures and I was really struggling. And I had written an article to the epilepsy magazine and I had asked them if they could publish my article. And I asked, in the article, how others cope with epilepsy, how they deal with it, because I really was coming to like a corner. I felt like I was backed into a corner. And surprisingly, after they published the article, I had probably like three or 400 letters come to my home from people all over the United States and Canada. And they were sharing their stories with me and sharing advice and sharing what they go through and how they deal with it. And it was so inspiring. And I learned a lot from it. As time went on, I had begun to write a book after college. And as I was writing that book, and as I was working, I had actually um, started working with an herbalist, and I started to do a lot of research for him. And I was learning a lot as I was doing all this research. And I started to see uh, things that pertain to myself. And I started to use some of the stuff I was learning in my own life. And surprisingly, uh, with my medication, my seizures started to go from nine seizures to six seizures just a four to three to two to one. And my seizures got to a point where they were pretty much controlled. And I realized that it's not just popping a pill. It's really about our lifestyle. It's about how we take care of our bodies, what we put into our bodies. And I started a blog and it was, you know, started out on blogger. I had a little blog and it was like 400 people came on and they would read my articles and get back to me and write things. And then it went from 400 suddenly to 10,000. And then one day I was working.
working because I did a lot of freelance work back then. And I was working with a, a web designer and he's like, you know, I could really make this website look really pretty for you. And he created a really nice website for me. And that website went from 400 to 10,000. And now we have over 350,000 monthly visitors on our website because so many people are so interested on how to heal the body naturally, how to improve their lives. People are sick of really popping a pill and they don't know how to really heal themselves. And they're looking for different options, healthier options. And that's where this has all led me. It just took me down a, a different path that I never thought I would actually go through. What was the time range when you were in college? And where I'm going with that is the internet, there is so much out there. And, you know, I would even argue in the world of healthcare and fitness, it's almost too much information to know which end is up. Are we talking about a time frame where the internet was available at all? Where did your research start? Um, actually, the, the, the internet didn't come until my junior year of college. And that's when we had the, da, 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 you know, and, <laughs> and we would have to change the wires, take the phone wire out and then put the internet wire in and quickly, you know, try to go on the internet and it would take forever to get on. But um, when I started, when I started working with the herbalist, um, it was a couple of years as when the internet had come on into play. And we was still, there was a lot of work to be done and they were still putting together a lot of things. And uh, it's nowhere like it was today. It was a good beginning and a lot of companies and a lot of medical companies and doctors and, and different websites and people were coming on and they were actually, you know, everybody was really excited about the internet. Is that how you came across the herbalist through the internet, like through your junior year? Or how did you come across that person? Oh, I was, I was actually, I was working and I was doing, um, I was doing a lot of uh, freelance work and I was doing a lot of article writing and um, he had contacted me and he was doing a, a lot of different projects and he asked me if I would help him with the research. And so I was doing from my home, I was actually researching and writing for him and, uh, and, you know, creating stuff and, and getting the information for him. And it was all through the internet. Yeah. What is the definition of an herbalist? I guess, is that a specific background or does that just depend on using natural remedies to get a certain result? And I'm, I'm guessing he was studying specifically epilepsy. That's how you guys came to connect. And where does what he's doing start and end? And then when you would get into, I guess, um, you know, somebody that's more medical. He was a natural doctor. He actually, I didn't meet him through epilepsy. He had saw a lot of my work and he saw a lot of my writing. So he had contacted me and asked me if I would be interested in doing something like this and me uh, liking health so much and, and so interested in health myself. And I have a passion for it. I was more than happy to actually jump on board and, and help him out. What were the specific things that he was studying when you first came across him? He was doing a lot of stuff on his website and he was putting together a lot of information for um, people who came onto his website. And so I was doing a lot of research, trying to put together, research different herbals and supplements and, and different ways of living and lifestyle changes and putting it all on paper in a, in a format that would, people could understand and actually go by. For the research that you were doing leading up to this becoming your full-time career, do you typically collaborate with a certain set of folks either that are very much focused in herbal remedies? D does that end up ever touching a more traditional medical doctor, let's say? How does the research come together for you for, you know, when you're putting together your books or, or articles on the website, directing people what types of options they have? Well, I always, when I, when I would write articles, I would always double check. I would like to mm -hmm. see what science has to say and what doctors right. have to say and what the medical field has to say, because I think mm -hmm. facts and science is, is a really strong part with science and, and with, in the medical industry, you know, they're testing to make sure that it's not just the short-term effects or the short-term results. It's what happens long-term as well. So you want to make sure when you give advice and when you, and you gear people to sort of certain directions that you want to make sure that you give them the best possible information and, and the most accurate. And I always try to do that. When I think of certain natural remedies, especially when I'm sick, <laughs> I 
try to go for things like, let's say, a stuffy nose. What are some of the natural things that I can use? Whether that's just a humidifier to the neti pot, you know, I think is gained in popularity. And, you know, and then if, if those things don't work, then I go, okay, you know, maybe I need to look at the over the counter thing or again, get to the doctor. Do you have any prescribed methods for doing that, you know, kind of starting with what the possible natural remedies would be. And then if it doesn't clear it up, is there sort of a tried and true process or is it vary depending on the condition, depending on the person? I had a virus and, and it went into a sinus infection. You know, I tried a lot of different natural remedies and I tried, you know, doing different stuff and I, I wasn't feeling better. So right away I went to the doctor because if your body isn't healing itself, then you need some help. If the body needs a little kickstart, you have to go see the doctor and you also don't want it to get worse and, and end up being something more severe. And we also can't always diagnose ourselves either because sometimes we don't know what we have. There's a lot of symptoms that could lead to a lot of different things. There's so many common symptoms, but it could be so many different things. And you, you want to make sure that you that what you have, that you make sure that it's diagnosed properly and, and that you actually get the right proper care for it. When you have a cold and you want to lose weight or you need energy and stuff like that, there's lots of things that you can do healing naturally that is great. But if you're starting to feel really sick and you're not feeling good and you're having a lot of problems, I, I'm the first one to say, go see a doctor because you, you never know and you don't want to take any chances. It makes me think of the self-diagnosis. The, st- the joke you always hear about WebMD, right? <laughs> if you put in like basic symptoms and then you get this mm-hmm. litany of super scary diseases that it says you could have. And it's like, oh my gosh, like I thought this was just going to be yeah. a common cold or, or something else, <laughs> not a big deal. And then things you've never even heard of, you know, start to get put in your head. So again, I think it goes back to, you know, the good old internet, right? It's like information overload. There's also a lot of false information too. So it's like overload and, and you have to be careful, you know, where you're getting the information from too. Right, exactly. And one of the things that I liked about how your website is set up for seems like first time visitors is what are you specifically looking for? And it's broken down into if somebody does have a condition that they're looking to treat, you know, they can go there and and find what their condition is. Um, Then you've got a section on nutrition, which from my standpoint, goes hand in hand. I think kind of like you were mentioning, even for your own background, what are those things that you can do that if they are preventable, you know, try to make them as preventable as possible. And then also a natural progression into exercise and and what can be done there. So that's kind of how I broke up the questions that I have here for you. And one thing I was curious about as I'm looking at those lists of conditions on the site, are there ones that you interact with the most that people come and ask you questions about? And I'd also be curious, or do you find that the things that people need the most help on are inherently preventable? Now, again, obviously everybody's situation varies, but sort of what are those main things that you come across questions from folks? I think a lot of people are interested in in stress and and they're interested in, you know, with um, feeling better and sleeping. A lot of people suffer from insomnia. I find that a lot of people are suffering from hair loss. You know, I get an overabundance of people asking questions about hair loss. Um, Diabetes is also a a popular topic, high cholesterol. You know, people go and to check on different things about the heart. You know, when, when you get to certain ages, you're more susceptible to, you know, heart attack or stroke and you really have to start taking care of yourself and people know that, but they don't know what to do. So they'll come on the website and they'll, they'll see the different topics. They'll learn about it and see things they could do at home that can help them prevent illnesses from occurring. And a couple of those cholesterol and depending on obviously the type of diabetes um, we're talking about diet. Yeah. Diet is very important. People don't realize it, but food is, is medicine. And, and what people also don't realize either is that what we put in our body plays an Im- impact on all the things that are going on in our bodies. People suffer from illness and they suffer from many different things. And then they don't, they're like, I don't know why I have this. And then you ask them what they're doing, what they're eating. Do they exercise? How do they take care of themselves? How much sleep do they get? And the answers will be horrible. And you have to realize that you can't 
consistently eat processed foods or eat overabundance of, uh, of, of the wrong foods and expect to feel good. If your body can't break down the foods, it stores it. And then, you know, what happens is a lot of times people are eating really bad foods or they're eating processed foods or foods that have a lot of different toxins in them and hormones and stuff like that. And the body doesn't know what this is. It doesn't know what it is and, and it can't break it down. So it stores it in the body. And then after so long of all these things in your body and they're not going anywhere, that wears on your organs, that wears on your body itself. You start feeling fatigued and you start seeing a lot of, that's when illnesses start to occur and lots of different things start to happen. And it's really how we eat plays a big factor in how we feel. So if I can categorize, it does sound like maybe a lot of the instances you get are I don't want to say preventable because that makes it sound like somebody's, you know, inherently doing something wrong, but let's say at least treatable. It's not something that there's nothing to be done. And with some of these tweaks for lifestyle, then that should be a good answer <laughs> for people to hear, right? It's not surgery. It's not to your point of having to go on a pill regimen. I'll stick with the cholesterol one. I know that baby aspirin, I think recently has come under fire as maybe not being for the daily baby aspirin, <laughs> the thing that, that people want to do related to blood pressure, cholesterol. And uh, it, going back to what you're saying for the processed foods, do you think that people just don't care as far as reading the labels or just don't have the time? Or is it they can get almost purposefully confusing that even when you're trying to be diligent, you don't necessarily know what all went into that thing you bought at the grocery store? We have a world that everybody is on the go. Everybody is rush, rush, rush. I have to be here. I have to be there. People are just either they're going out or ordering in or they're just or they're buying food that's already pre-made in the food stores. And all these things are processed. They're, they're added. They have all these different additives to make them last longer, to make them to stay fresh for a longer period of time. And after putting all these things in your body, you start to see your body to, to wear down and start feeling fatigue and you, and then things come about. But I think some people, some people have given up and, and there are some people that just don't know where to begin. And there are some people that just, they say they don't have the time, but we always have the time. We just have to figure a way that fits into each, each of our schedules that works the best. Some people do things the night before. Some people can do things on the weekend, maybe cook and then freeze it and then take some things out a day or two before and defrost it and and then cook it or just like make salads and there are different things you can do and to, to bring with you to lunch or for dinner. And But there's always a way. Are there any, whether it's a service you provide or maybe some that you've had good luck with, to your point, and I am right there with you, that the busy lives of everybody <laughs> seems to be one of the driving factors for getting a, again, a processed food or something like that or eating out. Have you come across any good services to maybe have meals prepared that I have ready to go to cut down some of that prep time? Or do you feel like people should just make at least a little bit of time to prepare your food at home? Or like you said, sort of make something in bulk on a Sunday and freeze it. What do you feel like is the best method to maximize time? Well, you know, I, I've had friends and, and, and people I know that have tried outside sources where food actually comes to the house or, you know, it's, and it's pre-made and some, some facilities, they actually send you the ingredients and then, uh, you know, a week's worth of ingredients, and then you just make the meals at home. But, you know, a lot of that stuff can get very costly. People don't really have a lot of, the, of that money because it adds up after a while. You know, for me, I, I feel the easiest way is to make time and to just, you know, try to prepare the meals at home. And, and it's also too, you know, our society has, we're so used to those big proportions. People have to realize that it's also, it's what we eat and how much we eat. And we, people have to realize that they have to cut down a little bit on those proportions and, and eat when their belly says full or when they've had a, a good size portion enough on a, in a healthier standpoint, they, they have to stop. One thing people don't realize when you talk about portions is when you're talking about fatty foods, you know, again, the processed foods, and you see what the calorie intake should be for the day, you're like, yeah, that's not going to be a big enough portion. But if you're talking about like vegetables in particular, I think 
if you saw the amount of vegetables you could have sort of at the same calorie level as some of this other stuff, your eyes would get big that you, you, there's a lot of food there to eat, right? Oh, yeah. The healthiest foods really is to stick to the greens. If you could stick to the greens, it's the best way to go. You know, people have written books on how you could even lose weight without having to exercise. People have talked about how eating more green could actually change your health and change your life. You feel so much better. And it's funny because after a while, if you start eating unhealthy foods or you start eating processed foods and then you start eating healthy, like you're stuff incorporating a lot of greens into your diet, it's a lot of salads, vegetables, and, and lots of stuff that's really good for your body. You'll notice that when you do eat something that's unhealthy, you'll all of a sudden notice that your body, your stomach doesn't feel so great because it's having a hard time actually processing the food because after it's been used to actually eating the right foods and eating healthy, and then you get stuck to, and then all of a sudden you go back to eating unhealthy foods, your body has a, a hard time actually digesting it and hasn't done it in a while. And you'll see that you, you you don't feel that great after you've gone the healthy route and then you start eating a little bit unhealthy. I have a story about that very thing. When I first got out of college, I am a terrible cook and don't really have patience for it. So at least I was being health conscious enough to where I had, you know, like the George Foreman grill and would just do grilled chicken or, or fish on there, you know, some rice and vegetables. And that was like my meal every day for a long time. And there was a day where I was out there was a fast food place and it was one of these like triple patty bacon cheese who knows what kind of sauce burger thing and I think I got the large huge fry and ate this thing and you know growing up I had my share of fast food and never was an issue but I felt so sick after my body had gotten used to not having <laughs> some of that stuff to your point it's amazing <laughs> how a on one end you can get used to it if you're eating it a lot and then b on the other end once you're not eating it how negative your body really can respond to things like fast food and again all that fat and grease afterward. You know, your body really wasn't meant to eat all those foods. We just we've just trained our bodies to do it. But our body has not really been we weren't meant to eat all these processed foods and to eat all these foods that we eat. It, it really puts a stress on our, on our body for sure. It puts a stress on our organs, our inflammation, and so many things. It affects your hormones. It's it's amazing what eating the wrong foods could do to your body. Now, how do you feel? You just said hormones, which actually makes me think the other way of people will talk about like uh, how cattle is raised or other things like that and sort of hormones and stuff that are going in to the meat products that you eat. Do you have a recommendation on when to go organic or like with the meat side, stick with grass fed, let's say, or, or like for chickens, like free range or things like that? Do you have any rule of thumbs there as far as what to look for? Well, personally, like when it comes to eggs, I always buy organic, you know, even though it's a little bit more money, you don't want those antibiotics and those uh, other things that they put in, in the eggs. They put a, a lot of different hormones in there. And, and if, if you actually look at some of the research, I actually had to do a book review a couple of years back and she talked about what they, what happens to the, the hens and, and the animals and the cows. And after reading her book, you, you never want to eat anything that comes from a, a regular farm. It was terrible what they did. And, and, you know, they, they clustered those chickens together in one small confined area. And if one got sick, they gave them all antibiotics and they, they, they gave them, they shot them up with hormones so the, the eggs would be bigger and plumper. Little girls were, were get, starting their menstruation cycle at, at a very young age, like eight years old, and they were starting to develop breasts at such a young age from all the hormones and that they, that they put in a lot of these foods. And I suggest when it comes to egg, go organic if you can, and milk, if you, if you drink milk, go organic. These are things that you really, you want to. Chicken, you know, they put arsenic in chicken, regular chicken, and they put different antibiotics and, and different hormones in the chicken to make it look bigger and plumper and, and to make it last longer and fresher. And all those things are terrible for your body. If you could do organic chicken and certain meats organic, I would suggest that as well. How about fish? Because I will admit that's one of the items where the more information that comes out, the more sad I get just because I always think I'm doing something good having fish. But then the more and more you hear about farm raised in particular, it, it's kind of scary. What, what tips do you have as far as buying and eating fish? I don't buy like the farm 
farm raised fish. I try to I try to get the fresh fish and I try to actually some of the fishes they would actually put color in in, in the fish to make it to make it look um, more appealing market wise. And you have to like really do your research and find out what kind of fishes to look for. And certain fishes that are closer to the ground in the ocean carry more mercury, you know, like tilapia carries a lot of mercury. And so you, you want to make sure that you know which fishes to get like salmon and then look for the type of fish that is, is the best, healthiest, and maybe look for certain brands and go into maybe certain fisheries. You know, if you have a local fishery, you know, maybe to check into that as well. A good point. And also, like you said, local, I'll, I'll jump off of that. It's kind of nice that, yes, it can be a little more expensive. Of course, everybody has to, you know, manage their own budget. But <laughs> one of the good news pieces, I think, for uh, you mentioned milk as well. If you're buying organic, more often than not, you're probably buying local. So there is at least the benefit of supporting your local economy. You'll notice a difference in your body. Like, you know, I notice when I, if I eat something that um, may not be organic and it has artificial, you know, ingredients in it, and I go on the scale, I notice right away that my water weight goes up tremendously. And it's the inflammation because your body, you know, is affected by this. And, you know, sometimes if you eat certain foods and you look down and you look like you're three months pregnant, it's because your body can't break it down. And it's because of what's in the food that you just ate. Now, it may not be the food itself. It may be the ingredients that they put in to keep this food fresh or p- bigger or plumper, you know, and it's affecting your body. If it's bloating your stomach and your body, can you imagine what it's doing to the rest of the parts of your body? Yeah, it's only the parts you can see that you know about and everything else. It probably isn't good either. Obviously, we're well into the, the nutrition considerations. Before we would completely leave, if somebody has particular ailments, going back to popping the pills and so on, do you have any experience, feel for recommendations as far as, let's just call it current state of healthcare system and precautions to give folks or anything like that as far as if they've been prescribed a particular thing or balancing healthy lifestyle with ultimately whether it's OTC medicine or something for a particular ailment that they have. Any rules of thumb that you tell people as far as medical prescriptions in particular? Well, you know, people have to really be honest with their doctors. I've seen people go doctor hop and if they don't get it from one doctor, they try to go to another and or they they get one medication and it gives them certain side effects and they don't realize that it's the medication causing the side effects. Then they go back to the doctor and say, well, you know, now I feel ex- I feel this way and that way. And they give them another prescription to help them with these symptoms. And before you know it, they have a closet full of medication in their drawer. And, um, you know, you have to really be careful what you're taking and how it's affecting your body. Um, You know, medications itself could be, you know, a hazard, you know, to your health. And it could also interact with other medications that you take. Same thing goes when you're taking supplements. You have to be careful before you take supplements as well. You know, what kind of medications you're on and make sure that it doesn't interact or cause any problems because medications and supplements are just as strong as medications. And a lot of medications are created from supplements. So, you know, that shows you how strong of an effect that supplements can have on your body. So you have to make sure that, you know, that your, the supplements aren't interacting with the medications. And if you're taking one medication and you're not feeling good and you're getting certain symptoms, you know, just don't take another medication. Try to, you know, it, the, the thing is, is finding the root cause of the problem. It's not the, the, the current symptoms. It's, it's what's causing these symptoms. And that's what you have to try to figure out with your doctor. Do you have any recommendations with supplements to your point, you have to handle them in a very specific way. I think one of the knocks to that world is that the regulations on them are presumably not as stiff as other medications and drugs that would be prescribed and, and so on. Do you have any recommendations for who people should consult? Obviously, their doctor makes sense, but but other folks that maybe would have good advice for what to consider if they are looking for some sort of a dietary supplement? I have gone to specialists in the past that have actually focused on a certain issue and um, they have been really helpful. And you also have to make sure that if you're taking medication, if a doctor or, or herbalist gives you a supplement or you get a medication from another doctor that, that will help you, you have to make sure it, it doesn't interact with other medications as well. Your primary doctor you know, knows a little bit about everything, but he doesn't know 
everything. So if you have a specific issue that you're, you're kind of, you know, battling with, then I would suggest seeing a specialist and getting some advice from a specialist. My background is in managed care, like um, the health insurance world. And that is very much a uh, concern that nobody is sort of reconciling these things that are being prescribed. So, you know, you could end up getting one thing that will balance you know, negatively with something else that's being taken. But, you know, the pharmacist, doctor, whoever don't have all the information because if a patient's going from place to place, they just don't have it. So, so absolutely, you know, and even like you mentioned, if somebody's going to a specialist or wherever they're at, emphasis on maintaining your own records so that um, you can give that information, even if you're just going for a second opinion, which is totally a, a normal thing to do, but whoever you're going to can't really effectively help you if they don't have all the information <laughs> about you. I think, I think, like you mentioned before, people hopefully just good intentions. They're forgetting, <laughs> you know, everything that there is to tell, rather than purposefully not telling everything. But yeah, you, you sort of don't think of potentially dangerous effects that could occur if one well-meaning person is giving you advice, or again giving you a prescription, or whatever that happens to be but they don't know what the other well-meaning person has done up to that point it can be really dangerous. Oh, definitely. You know, and I always suggest too, detoxing is a great option as well. Um, people don't realize, but over the years, our body just accumulates toxins from all different areas of life. And, you know, that plays a big um, role on how we feel as well. You know, all these toxins that we incur, you know, they, they, they affect all different parts of our body. And, you know, detoxing your body every so often could actually help and, and make you feel better, help you focus, help you your digestive tract, help your organs. Um, it could do a lot for you. And it actually could maybe help the problems that you're actually, you know, your obstacle in at that moment. You know, um, when you cleanse your body and you, you, um, your body can actually start functioning properly because if everything is not functioning at a hundred percent, you know, you're, you're feeling fatigued. You're not, you're not able to focus. You feel bloated. You know, you just, you know, you can't, you know, you're getting cramped and this and that and this bothers you and that bothers you and you know you're having trouble sleeping all these things could be from toxins as well can you walk me through what a standard detox would be i think there's some folks that i've worked with that i want to say it's i know it's a lot of water <laughs> of course and i think certain drinks that have like pepper flakes or, or something like that in them on certain intervals. Can you just walk me through what would be a standard? Well, there's lots of different things that could detox your body. But for me, you know, I, I tell people, believe it or not, you have over your, your, your colon is filled with over 12 to 15 pounds of, of stool, which is toxins in itself. So I always suggest people when they start to detox to do a colon cleanse to, to cleanse out all that, that stool, because that stuff, um, you might not realize it, but it plays a role in your, in your body, inside your intestines. It affects the digestive tract. When something is, is off, the rest of your body is off. And then you can do a whole body cleanse and you can cleanse your liver and you can cleanse your, you know, you could take supplements. You, you know, you don't have to do the, the uh, peppermint or lemon, lemon drink or, you know, and just drink water. For me, I can't do that. You know, I just can't just drink water and, and, you know, some of the, they, you know, I've seen many different types of, um, you know, uh, different uh, cleanses where they just they drink for X amount of days and they do this and that. Um, but you can you can use supplements to, to cleanse your body. You can use fiber. You can they have whole body cleanses where they combine different supplements that are known to cleanse the body. Dandelion tea is a great tea. It cleanses the um, the body it, and it can cleanse your your intestines. And you can take that at night and it actually has a very pleasant taste to it. And is that sort of a one time whenever you think that you're feeling down or just are looking for some way to feel better? Or does that end up being sort of a regimen that you do, I don't know, once every six months or every couple of months or anything like that? Or, or is it just very dependent on a person's condition? I think it's dependent on a person's condition. But I also, I personally, I detox quite often um, because, you know, the air you breathe, the, the even the for women, the makeup you use, there's a lot of makeup that actually, you know, goes into your pores and has toxins 
proteins in it. And it actually, you know, affects the skin. And sometimes you might see reactions or dryness in your skin. And that could be from, well, the, the makeup you use or the food you eat, you know, or the drinks that you're drinking, you know, um, there's lots of things that can cause toxins in the body. So for me, I, I like to tox, detox frequently. And I, I definitely feel a difference. I feel more energetic. I feel much better. And I actually noticed that my, my weight stays stable and, you know, I, I have more energy. I'm more focused. I sleep better. I notice a lot of different things. Well, it's good for me to hear that maybe there's other ways of going about it. Cause actually a guy that I used to run with, poor guy was doing, you know, sort of the massive amounts of water plus I forget what all was in the drink. And I'm thinking like, how are you even standing when we run, you know, like four or five miles? Cause like I would be passing out here, you know, if that's all I had, which I guess to your point, it depends on what somebody's background is and the nuances of their body uh, for what type of uh, cleanse they can go through. Right. Yeah. It, it depends on the person. Everybody's body is different and what works for one person may not work for the next person. So it really depends on, on you, the person itself. Specific diets, fads come and go. Some work, some don't. Again, even going back to when we're talking about cholesterol, let's say, you know, it's gone from being one of these super horrible things. You got to really watch what types of foods you're eating to, well, maybe it's not so bad. And the uh, LDL, HDL, that ratio rather than just one versus the other, uh, so on and so forth. So certainly I think people get tired of the different diets because it seems to change all the time. Are there any out right now that you either really like or on the other end, are there any that you would steer people away from? Right now, the keto diet has been very hot. Um, people have been, I know people that have done it. I have one, one friend of mine that lost between 35, 40 pounds on it. But that's not something that you want to do for long term either. You know, you're eating a lot of high fatty foods and high cholesterol. And, and, you know, you want to make sure, you know, something like this, you know, you don't do for very, you know, too long because you don't want to make it your lifestyle because, you know, it might actually do more harm in the long term. And it's good for the short term. Um, you know, I, what I've seen really that works great with people that I, I like is, People kind of start reading the labels. They start looking at how much calories everything is, and they look at, um, you know, how much, uh, you know, what's in, in the what's in the product, and you know, they start kind of in in their head. They start calculating throughout the day, and you know, what's great is the, the Weight Watchers diet. Actually, you know, you don't have to buy their food, but their their regiment, the way they do things, is great. You know, they count points, and there's actually an app on the phone that you can get where you can, every food that you eat, you could actually swipe the, uh, the back label and it will count the points for you. And it'll tell the person how many points they have left for the day. So, you know, if you're eating too much or it kind of teaches you how to eat because a lot of people don't, you know, eat too much. They don't realize, you know, that, you know, um, you know, certain, the, the portions that are normal are very small, you know, in Europe, you, you go, if you sit down for a meal in Europe, the, the portions are so small compared to what the American size is, you know, it's, uh, it's crazy, you know, um, um, you know, what we eat versus, you know, what other countries eat and, but they're on a much healthier stand than we are, you know, when it comes to, you know, portion size. And moving over a little bit to the fitness part. And like you mentioned, portion size, and then reading the labels, it seems like the things that I've seen more recently are definitely pointing to the diet being the larger contributor to uh, people being overweight or obese rather than exercise. And, and even depending on who you ask, they'll suggest that, you know, the, the fitness industry would like to keep the diets the way they are so that they can keep coming out with, you know, bigger and better uh, fitness regimen. So do you tend to agree that it is diet that is more of the contributing factor than, you know, just being a couch potato? Well, diet, I think is, is the number one, you know, important, but you also need to really need to incorporate some type of exercise in your, in your diet as well. You know, even whether it's 15 minutes 
or, you know, 45 minutes or an hour, you have to have some type of exercise, you know, because you'll notice even if you, if you sit around and you become a couch potato, you'll start seeing the veins pop through your leg, you know, your sl- circulations will start to slow down. Um, you know, you'll start seeing your body become very sluggish and you'll start seeing, you know, your, even your mentality goes downhill. So you really, you know, um, exercise is very important in all aspects, mentally and physically. And it's good for people to have some type of exercise. And if they're, you know, not in the best, you know, health, um, you know, just do a little exercise, walk around the block. You know, there's lots of things you can do. You can go on a, you know, on an exercise bike for 10, 15 minutes. You know, there's things you can do that work for you and everybody should have some type of exercise. They should make sure they, they put a little exercise in there, in their diet. And if you could do more, great. Yeah. You know, the, the more, the better, but for people who struggle health wise, you know, they should try to put some type of exercise because you do see, you feel a lot better when you exercise. Do you think people will struggle more with sticking with a diet program or an exercise program or both? Fitness, I think sometimes it gets hard because when you, if you stop, it's very hard to get back into it. You know, it, where you can, when you're, when you're eating, you know, you could buy the right foods, bring it into the house and you can start all over again. You know, you can screw up and the next day you say, all right, I'm going to be good tomorrow. But when you exercise, when you don't exercise for a while, you tend to get lazy and you tend to, you, you tend to have a hard time actually getting into it. Your, your strength actually decreases, your muscles decrease. And you, you'll notice that it, you know, you might not be able to, to do as much as you did, you know, a month ago when you were doing it consistently. So it's, I think it's definitely harder, if, you know, to, um, when you stop exercising to, to get back into it, where it's easier to, to put yourself back on a, on a good diet again. How much do you think boredom plays a role in an exercise regimen? You know, we didn't really actually talk about that even for the healthy eating, which I imagine, you know, that is this something that is uh, a consideration when trying to eat healthy. But um, also for fitness, do you think nobody gets really excited to go on the treadmill, <laughs> right? So, so having to do that every single day, you know, probably isn't isn't going to work out for folks. So do you recommend various different types of exercises or how do you go about that? On my phone and um, I, I have an MP3 player, I could actually, you know, record books on there. I could put, you know, music on there. And I always make sure that I have like, you know, either if it's a it's an audio book or it's, you know, music that I really like to listen to that's going to pump me up. You know, you do things that you like that will actually motivate you to, to you know, inspire you, you know, and to keep you, you know, occupied. Some people like watching TV and sometimes you'll see in the, in the gyms, if you go to a gym, they have a lot of TVs all over the place. You know, you have to do what, what really, you know, works for you and, and not focus on how long you've been there and what, you know, and, you know, but just, just, you know, focus on just exercising and, you know, maybe put your mind in a different place. You know, sometimes just, you know, going off in la la land and daydreaming and thinking about things that are pleasant can actually distract you. And and before you know it, you know, time can go by quicker that way too. Are there any personal favorites for yourself as far as exercise regimens or just exercises that you do yourself? I enjoy doing the treadmill. I enjoy yoga. I enjoy meditation. Meditating in the morning, you know, helps me focus much better throughout the day. I, um, you know, when I do yoga, it's great for your circulation and for your stretch. So many people suffer from pain. We talked earlier about what people really come on the website for. Well, pain was a major one, you know, just people have suffer from pain for all different reasons and headaches and you know, and exercise and, and doing yoga and, and meditating. These are things that can actually help, you know, like with yoga, you're stretching your body, you're, you know, you're, you're helping your circle, increase your circulation. And that could help with pain. You know, people say, well, I can't, they think of like, you know, those people who exercise yoga that are so flexible, I can't do that. But there's so many different types of yoga. And there's so many different, you know, um, you know, there's different levels where you can, you can, you know, there's very simple ones where you could just, you know, stretch to the left, stretch to the right, and you're doing Zen yoga, you know, like, you know, simple things that actually can help. When I was on the site, couldn't help myself. I saw a a link for CBD, which speaking of things that are real buzzwords right now, I see advertisements everywhere. And now I haven't gotten a chance to read, you know, all the articles that you have posted, but 
what has been your experience or what's your perspective on CBD at this point? Again, like I said, made me think of it because you mentioned pain and obviously I think like joint pain and there's the oils that is one version of it. I know you mentioned uh, at the very beginning of the show, anxiety and stress are, are typical things that people are looking for remedies for on your site. And CBD is also pointed to as being something that can help that. So what have you found up to this point as far as CBD? Is it something you recommend for certain ailments? or is it just a fad as well? I think CBD is a, a great supplement. I think that it's going to be very helpful later on, especially to, um, you know, the medical field itself. It just um, They just had um, uh, created a drug for people with epilepsy that is CBD for specific types of seizures. So the, the marijuana leaf has over, I believe it's over a, str- a thousand strands in it. So there's different, there's different things in each strand that can be used for different reasons. And the leaf is component for THC, which is the part that can get you high. And then there's CBD, the part that can't get you high. And, you know, what happens with CBD is that it blocks certain pain receptors and it could actually block the brain from actually saying, I'm in pain. It, the brain says I'm in pain, and then you know you it uh, you feel the pain, and then the pain goes to your brain, and then your brain says I'm in pain. Well, the CBD can block that, so when you're in pain, it's not going, and and it's not so powerfully saying I'm in pain, and it actually blocks the the certain nerves and and, and certain parts of the body where so you don't feel as much in pain, you feel a reduction in pain. Some people, you know, dependent on the extensity of their, of their pain, some people might not feel the pain after taking CBD. Um, CBD is, is great for lots of things. It also calms and relaxes you. It, you know, people take it before bed. Some people that suffer from anxiety take it to calm themselves down. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's used for a lot of different things and they're finding it very helpful. They're doing a lot of research right now. Doctors are doing a lot of research. The medical field is are, are doing a lot of research. Scientists are doing a lot of research. But that you know, with that, every time people see there's something good out there, you know, everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon and unfortunately try to make money. So there's a lot of CBD out there that's not actually good CBD. You have to be very careful. You know, you have to be like even like CBD gummy bears are very popular, but. They've also found that, you know, there are companies out there that, you know, the CBD is not inside the gummy. It's sprinkled on top of the gummy. So, you know, there are, they were companies that found that, you know, they weren't, they didn't have as much CBD as they claimed to have. So you have to really go out there and you have to like, you know, go to quality brands and make sure when you purchase um, CBD, you, you use a brand that is noted for, you know, um, for, for the extensity of producing good, um, um, brands and and good CBD because, you know, there are a lot of companies out there just looking to make a quick buck. You know, you could buy, you could buy actually um, any type of supplement and buy your own label and place it on and say, this is mine. That's what a lot of people do, you know, and that's why you see so many brands out there. You know, they're not just, it's, you know, they can, you could easily, you know, buy from the the company itself and then put your own label on it. Some companies give you permission to do that. One place where I see the ads or offers, I guess, is like Groupon. There's like eight or nine CBD gummies on it. And I'm like, yeah, what's the difference? (laughs) So I imagine there is, to your point, a lot of variance in quality and what you're getting. Oh, most definitely. And you have to be careful. And, you know, and then, you know, it affects people differently. So it's like, you know, um, some people may need more CBD. Some people may need less. If you take too much, you might become very tired, you know, so you have to be really careful when you, when you start using CBD, you know, and also you have to make sure, um, that you're not um, taking other drugs that interact with CBD. Like for instance, I take a medication for my epilepsy that actually interacts with CBD. Um, I just recently found out like a couple of weeks ago that it could decrease the potency of the CBD. So I got really scared because I was taking CBD at night it helped me go to sleep. So I quickly stopped just to be on the safe side because I didn't want to start anything, you know, that 
been, you know, doing really good. So, you know, for me, I just quickly stopped and I, I didn't even want to take a chance. Um, but for, for people, you know, that take any type of epilepsy medication, depression medication, heart medication, high cholesterol, you know, these are things that, you know, you want to make sure that if you're going to take CBD, ask your doctor and make sure the medication you're taking or ask your pharmacist, make sure it doesn't interact with it and can, can decrease the potency of the medication. It may not decrease the potency, but it could. So you don't want to take a chance. So again, emphasis to make sure you're working with your health provider in, in every capacity with this as well, so that you know what you're getting into. That definitely makes sense. The last thing that I had on my list is there's a section on the site about natural beauty remedies. Now you mentioned hair loss also at the beginning of the show. So I think for guys listening to this, that probably is the most relatable beauty remedy, if we would call it that. <laughs> and maybe it's just because I'm sort of hitting that age where I'm about the age where they'd be marketing to me <laughs> for this kind of stuff. What do you tell folks who are interested in, I guess, either hair restoration or just keeping what they have? Believe it or not, when people think about hair loss, the first thing that comes to mind is um, men. You know, there's 35 million men today that's in the United States that suffer from hair loss. But people don't realize there's over 21 million women who suffer from hair loss too. Um, you know, hair loss is actually caused by a hormone called um, DHT. And what happens is testosterone enters the a uh, antigen uh, receptors and it interacts with the 5 alpha reductus and that converts into DHT. And it's the DHT that causes hair loss or hair thinning in men and women. But, you know, there's different supplements that actually can help with hair loss. They've been finding that uh, green tea extract, caffeine, uh, saw pimento, um, uh, pumpkin seed oil, canine extract, biotin. These are some supplements that actually work really well and it actually can help block the DHT receptors. And, you know, I came across one thing, um, you know, I was really um, excited about it. It was called, um, it was by, hair, I believe it's Hair Restorations uh, Laboratories. And it was excellent because it, would, it carried all the supplements that we were just talking about. And it was had a lot of different vitamins and it had a lot of different um, things in it that actually help with hair loss. So I got some, I gave it to my husband, I gave it to my son who was complaining that he's starting to see a little hair loss going on on the sides of his hair. And, you know, they've been having really good um, experience with it. And I actually started taking the... Um, the uh, thickening. I, I have my hair is long. Like in the last couple of uh, months that I've been using it, I know my hairdresser told me, "Stacy, your hair got thicker." She goes, "What are you doing?" You know, because you, you don't realize it, but if you you apply these things topically, um, you could actually, you know, and you um, you could actually improve your your hair condition. But there's so many things out there. You know, people don't. You know, people have said, "I've tried this, I tried that, and you know, this doesn't work, and that doesn't work." Um, you know, you really yeah, you have to really know, like we talked earlier about CBD, you have to realize what brands are quality and what brands are not. And you also have to use it for a while. You know, I find that many people, and this is not just even with hair loss, but with everything, you know, they're like, well, I've done this, you know, and it doesn't work. I'm like, well, how long did you do it for? You know, and they're like, ah, a week or two. You know, when anything, you, when anytime you try anything, you know, you have to give it time, you have to give your body time for it to work. And even with these hair loss supplements and, and the hair restoration laboratories um, products, you have to give it at least three months to see a difference. You know, you have to give it time. And that goes with anything. You know, you really have to give your body time to react to what you're trying to do to it. It just so happens uh, my wife is a dermatologist, so I would probably have to emphasize in the same way we've mentioned with other considerations that, like you said, getting into a certain regimen or if something's not working or, you know, whatever else the cause may be, again, work with your physician. Like I said, in her case, she tends to get hair loss questions quite a bit because that, that falls right into the to the dermatologist world. So certainly they'd be able to advise as well of what may or may not work in that world. So that is helpful. And then natural beauty remedies in general, of course, the question I put down is me knowing absolutely nothing about beauty products. I am one of three boys growing up, so <laughs> we <laughs> have no exposure to anything around beauty secrets or anything like that. High level, what would be something for people to 
stay away from that wouldn't be considered natural? And then what are sort of some examples of other natural remedies or natural things to try? A lot of people, you know, they try different types of moisturizers or makeup or even people like they're, you know, they, the bath bombs are really popular right now. And I've, I've known people that actually have had problems because the stuff they put in them. Um, a lot of these beauty products, um, you have to look the ingredients. You know, sometimes you'll you'll fall off the, your chair if you read some of the ingredients that are actually in these things that we're putting in our skin and in our body. People don't realize, but a lot of this stuff, everything that we put that goes through our pores, goes right into our bloodstream and has a powerful effect on the body right away. And that's why you, if you see someone, let's say if your wife was putting on makeup and she ever had a reaction to it, it happened right away because it went into her pores, into her bloodstream and the body had a, a, a reaction right away to it. You have to be really careful of the products you're using, especially topically on your body, on your face, you know, in your skin, you know, it actually, you know, you're, it's, it's not just staying on top of your skin, it's going inside inside your body. And so you have to make sure when you're using these things, you have to make sure what you're using and what it's in the actual ingredients, you know, because you'll see, you know, you, you might not feel good. You might get a rash. You might feel sluggish. You know, something doesn't feel right. And it could be just what you're putting the lotions or the, or the makeup or the things that you're doing, you know, to try to make yourself look pretty. You might be actually killing yourself at the same time. And I'm thinking that these concepts go hand in hand with a lot of the other things that we were talking about. Again, healthy diet, healthy exercise, lifestyle, a lot of the things, let's say like cover up because you have blemishes or so on. Well, it's possible that there's something else that you're doing lifestyle wise that's making you more prone to a particular type of blemish. So if you actually <laughs> fix that at the core, then you actually don't even necessarily need the cover up or the other considerations there. So it, it seems to me that, that all of those concepts are going hand in hand. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Because, you know, your body, you know, tends to have a reaction or if you clog your pores, for instance, you could be using something that clogs your pores and it causes, you know, it causes you to have a pimple and it causes you to, to have that, you know, blackhead or, you know, um, and then you're like, oh my God, I have have these pimples, blah, 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 blah. But you could, and you could be having a reaction to something too. And you can get these pimples just from a reaction and not even realize it. An emphasis, I think you mentioned before of treating a root cause or looking for the root cause and not necessarily just getting focused on the symptom. Otherwise you could really, you know, sort of be spinning your wheels. Issues will just keep re reoccurring over and over again. And that can cost a lot of money, a lot of heartache <laughs> and, and otherwise. Things like acne and, and, and different things that you could actually do cure from home that won't, you know, that you can find in your kitchen, you know, and you could actually, you know, even on our website, you can look up a, a, a condition and, and, you know, look up different, you know, possible remedies that might actually work. And you'll see a lot of herbs are really, you know, popular, you know, the, the herbs that we put on our food could actually heal the body in lots of different ways as well. We talked about like pepper and pepper is really canine pepper, you know, can do a lot of things for the body and it can detox the body, cleanse the body, you know, and, and it could help even when you're, when you're sick and you're not feeling well. For folks that are listening, yeah, head on to the complete herbal guide.com and that's Stacy's website. I've spent some time out there and it's really easy to navigate. Like I mentioned, getting to the particular conditions that are addressed as well as a whole host of additional information around fitness and just general nutrition and so on and so forth. So I encourage folks definitely to do that. And Anne, also just a reminder of your book, The Complete Guide to Natural Healing and Natural Remedies for Common Conditions. I know you're on Amazon, so folks can should be able to find you very, very easily. Do you want to go ahead and give the rest of your contact information and your social network information? Sure. Um, we're located, I also have um, a Stacy Chalemi website that actually, and it also has the link to the, the, the main website. Um, you know, you can find me on, on the internet. Um, we have uh, Facebook, um, the Complete Herbal Guide. We have Twitter, the Complete Herbal Guide. Um, you know, we're on Pinterest. Um, we, we've uh, touched base with all the different like Instagram. So you can find us um, everywhere. You could just type in, you know, the Complete Herbal Guide and we'll pop up. And if you want to contact us or even go on our website and, and contact me, um, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions or if you have any curiosities or if you want to, you know, find out something, you know, if we're able to help, I'm more than happy to help. 
Perfect. And of course, we will put all of your contact information in the show notes as well as post links uh, to your pages on the website once uh, this episode is published. Stacey, I really appreciate you taking some time to talk to us today. Is there anything that we missed? No, I, I think we covered pretty much, we, we covered all the main, you know, topics. And I think, you know, we also on our website, um, we have a recipe section. So if people don't know, you know, what to make or how to make it, you know, they can, you know, even come to our website to find different, um, different recipes and, you know, different smoothies for maybe for the morning or different shakes that they can drink in the morning. You know, we talked about rush, rush and on the go and not having time. Well, there's different shakes too. Like, you know, for instance, my husband in the morning, you know, he'll make a, a healthy shake and he's on his way to work. And, you know, a lot of times he doesn't sit down for breakfast and he'll take, you know, he'll make that shake and he'll, he'll go and he, and he'll drink it in the car, but he's eating something healthy, you know, and it has all the different nutrients and all the different vegetables and fruits in it. And, you know, and, and, and the proteins that he needs and it's filling him up. And, uh, you know, those are things that you can learn on the website as well and, and find out how to make them. So you're saying that people don't have to have grilled chicken from a George Foreman grill and brown rice every single day. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can change it up. You know, a lot of people, you know, they have a lot of fun with, uh, you know, making smoothies and, and doing, and even like um, when, when uh, making breakfasts and, and putting different types of healthy nuts and different types of, of things in, in their, in their um, cereals or uh, oatmeal and stuff like that. And, you know, and different fruits and stuff like that. And that can be just as nutritious and very easy to make in just a few seconds. You're speaking my language actually with the smoothies. I work, <laughs> I work from home during the day and I definitely am the type that if there's bad stuff in the house, I'm just going to grab it and sort of mindlessly eat. So I sort of try to get turned on to smoothies and sort of sneak the vegetables in there <laughs> when you can't taste it. So I, I second that and am always open to suggestions for, you know, making the smoothies a little more interesting, you know, meal over meal. So that's great. Well, there's a will, there's a way, you know, so it, it, there's always a, a, a way to eat healthy and, you know, there's no excuse. Everybody can do it. Well, again, Stacey, I appreciate your time. I think there's a lot of information for people to be able to go out and get and, you know, apply to their lifestyle. So uh, again, appreciate it. And uh, we'll be in touch. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this. And you know what? The conversation was great. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks. You too. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get podcasts. If you'd like to be notified of future weekly episodes, please hit the subscribe button. If you'd like to help us further, head on over to SuburbanFolk.com and sign up for our email list. There's also a donate option where every dollar received helps us make a better show for you. Thank you. Suburban Folk is part of the Pod All the Time podcasting network with 11 other great podcasts. Special shout out this week to the Round and Round podcast and the Random Unnamed podcast who were nice enough to play our promo episodes. Be sure to search for them wherever you get podcasts and give them a listen. The information on this podcast has not been evaluated by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. The statements and products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. The information provided is intended to improve your health, fitness, and performance. It is not a substitute for face-to-face -face consultation with your health care provider and should not be construed as medical advice. The entire contents of this podcast are based upon the opinions of our host and guest, unless otherwise noted.